I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's why I say to you today that this word that we're talking about today, the spiritual word, is going to be much more profitable than the when we're born into the world. Through this spiritual birth, we give ourselves to the Lord. But He just simply said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus pressing the Lord to a, a, a better, a better uh, understanding maybe, so Nicodemus saith unto him, Now, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Well, that time has passed. A miracle has happened. Let's just suppose for a moment. Nicodemus asking the question and uh, presenting it to the Lord in that, in that way. If it should be possible in today's lifestyles, if it should be possible, that one could enter back into the mother's womb and to be born again. What are the chances that that person would be born again? You know what I'm talking about? And all of the bad things that are out there in the world, there might be that day of abortion. may not return. The dangers of the world are ever present before us. But Nicodemus was saying to the Lord, how can we do this? What it was, Nicodemus wasn't grasping the thought that Jesus was putting forth. So Jesus goes a little deeper with him. Verily, verily, I say unto, you, unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I know that we have out there in the world many faiths, many beliefs, many doctrines, that are going out into the world. But here Jesus has said it very simple. If we understand the words that Jesus is putting forth, and He says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. To me, that simplifies the matter of that being born again that is going to come from a certain area of the Bible. I'm not going to get that birth by water and the Spirit from all of the Bible. So there is a specific place that this life begins. Our obedience begins. The birth begins to take place. So upon the completion of the study of the Bible, then we submit to the things that God has required of us, things like hearing, believing, uh, repenting, confessing Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, and being baptized in His name. So we begin to work to that in order to have this new birth come into our life. So, simply speaking, the Gospel holds the power to give us that new birth. If you recall, as the Gospel began to be preached, now Jesus did many things in His life. He taught many words, gave forth many words. But what Jesus did in His life in the preaching of the Gospel, that He preached the Gospel of the Kingdom. Now listen to what I'm saying and follow me through this. Jesus, the Son of God, came into the world preaching the Gospel of the Kingdom. The kingdom wasn't here. What Jesus was teaching was that this gospel is going to go out there into all of the world and then the kingdom will come. The gospel had to first be preached before the kingdom could be established. So in Jesus' life, He preached the, the gospel that was going to be preached again. Now, it, it, it necessarily maybe would not be preached in the order that it had been in, in Jesus' life. Because many things were going to happen to benefit the people in their understanding. It wouldn't be the gospel of the kingdom. It would be the gospel in the kingdom. 
And out of that gospel would it come. Let me read Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. And this gospel in the life of Christ that Christ was preaching, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now as Jesus was preaching the, the, the gospel of the kingdom with no kingdom established, but yet we know there was a day appointed of God that this was going to be, the kingdom was going to be established, and then the gospel would have to take a certain route into this to present this kingdom. You know what I'm talking about? Everything that Jesus taught in His life was prophecy. It was good. Wonderful for the people. Every work that He did, healing the people, it was all beautiful. But today, when we talk about the gospel and that being born again, we know that we're going to have to realize that the water and the Spirit holds the power of God to make us a part of that kingdom. Where do we get that? In the kingdom. Jesus spoke of it before the kingdom. But the thing that many don't understand is that what Jesus did in His life as He lived in the world would have to be filtered. You know what a filter is? If you have a bad water system, and you want to get better water, we go out and spend money to buy a filter. Filter out all of the impurities. I'm not saying to you today that Jesus taught any impurity in His life. He didn't do that. He was perfect. But in our application to what we men have done with the Gospel is that they are uh, failing to see that what Jesus taught in His life would have to be taught again. And that's what Jesus made arrangements to be done. So, Jesus saying to the disciples, the gospel will be preached. In Mark, chapter 16, and verse 15 and 16, at the point of the ascension that Jesus was going to ascend back to the Father, and He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. What gospel were they going to preach? The gospel that Jesus would reveal to them by the Spirit of God as He came from heaven and set up on them at Jerusalem. That's going to be the Gospel. Now Jesus had talked about those things in His life. But He says, you hear that which is going to come. You be willing to receive that Spirit because it is He that is going to direct you in everything to bring the church into the world. That will be the Gospel. That will be important for the people today. So where do we get that gospel that we are depending upon to save us today? Paul would say, by his words, you are called by our gospel. It was the apostles' gospel. Gospel of Christ. But it was put in the power of the apostles by that Spirit, and that is the gospel that we have today. Now, here's the thing. Were you called by the gospel into the kingdom? Beginning at the preaching of the gospel in Acts chapter 2, were you called by the gospel at that time? I know no place in this gospel where that you are called by this gospel to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This gospel begins at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and it's going to extend them to the end of the world. So if you were called by another word of God in another time to be a part of this kingdom, then you were not called by His gospel. That's the gospel that I'm preaching to you today. The gospel of Jesus Christ that came through the Spirit of God upon the apostles. And if you will recall, if you have a problem with believing that you're doing... Uh, 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 a thing that's unworthy by receiving the Spirit over Christ and understand the Gospel. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 3.17, the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So if you have a misunderstanding that you fear that if you receive the Spirit you're going to be rejecting Christ, no, the only way you're going to receive Christ and the Father is to receive the Spirit. I believe there are two places in the
Bible that teaches us that. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 40 would be one of those. John 13 and verse 20 will be another. And Jesus simply says to the disciples, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Is it simple? What other course do we have to follow? We do not, but we are not called into the kingdom of God. We are not called into the church by another word that doesn't come as filtered through that Spirit of God. Every word made perfect as Jesus has taught it in His life. But that has to be the purity of God to establish the church. We might say it was a translation. Had to be translated in the language that we can understand. So, the Lord has worked all of this to be for us, but the Gospel is that which is preached by the Apostles. And I fear that the people that don't understand that will have a problem in the day that the Lord comes. Now, Jesus has given the disciples a commission Mark 16 and 15, He says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You receive that Spirit because that Spirit will be Me. When you receive that Spirit, you are receiving Me, and when you receive Me, you are receiving Him that sent Me. So what happens? The Word began to be filtered even before Jesus ascended, didn't He? When Jesus gave the commission of Matthew 28 19, it wasn't the city God had chosen. It wasn't uh, uh, the wording that was going to be come from Jerusalem. And therefore we know that it was not ordained of God to be a part of the church in the order that God, that God, that Jesus presented it at Galilee. So Jesus actually began to filter what He had taught through His life more perfectly for the church to come into the world. So when He gave Matthew 28, 19 to 11 of the disciples, one disciple was missing. One disciple could not have preached that commission regardless. And Jesus don't work like that. That's not the God that I know. That's pure confusion in the minds of men that will go back to what Jesus had done in His life, reject the Spirit of God when all of the power of God is put in to that Spirit. So where are we today in our understanding of the Gospel? If we are called by this Gospel, we are called by the preaching of the Apostles. That's all. There is no other calling. But Jesus in preparation of the Kingdom coming into the world, and He gathers now with the disciples at Jerusalem for the time that He's going to ascend, and I'm going to turn to Luke chapter 24. If you want to turn there with me for just a moment. Jesus begins to open their understanding at verse 44. And He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now look what happens. Then He opened, then opened He their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. What Scriptures? The Scriptures that Jesus had taught them during His life. Now the understanding is being opened. But how is it being opened? He gave them a commission in Matthew 28, which will be the resurrection. But during that 40 days, Jesus working with them, speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom, was teaching them of things that would be just a little bit different. Because He was going to be the translator of it, he would be the filtering of it as it would enter into the apostles. So look what Jesus says. In verse 46, and said, and said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Now, here's the understanding that of the Scriptures that's being opened. No mistakes. When the Spirit comes, follow that Spirit. And that repentance and remission of sins 
should be preached in His name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the city that God worked through all of the times. And He helped that city where the temple had been built. He made that temple a house of prayer. But there come the day that the temple was destroyed. When Jerusalem was fallen, the temple was gone. So what happened? Now the church is ready to come into the world and Jesus is saying to the disciples, And behold, I send the promise of My Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. What is the importance of Jerusalem? Let me just throw this in for a moment. If you turn to the book of Luke in chapter 2, you will find there that what God had done through Christ with Israel. Jerusalem was that city. When the people would go to the Passover, they couldn't just go anywhere for that Passover. They would have to go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the city held in order of God for His people. So when Jesus was born into the world, then that yearly day come that they would have to go to Jerusalem. Think on this line, on this thought. When Jesus had reached the age of twelve, the day come that the Passover would be honored. So they <coughs> travel to Jerusalem. They go to Jerusalem and they spend their time there during that period of time. And when the Passover is ended, then of course they make preparation to return home. Well, did they really prepare? Just about as much as people are preparing for the kingdom of God today. When it come time to make the journey back to Nazareth of Galilee, they got all things ready and they thought they had all things ready. And so they left Jerusalem and they began to travel. Now it took some time for this to come to their mind. Jesus wasn't a problem. He was the problem child. But in, in, in the process of preparing to return to their home, they just didn't make sure that Jesus was with them. Their son. So they traveled three days and they suddenly realized, hey, we don't have Jesus with us. Where's our son? What did they have to do? They had to return to Jerusalem. Else they would not have gotten their son. They might have said, well, you know, Jesus is old enough. He knows the way. He'll be home. Let's just go on to, to Nazareth and, and he'll be there. No, they returned to Jerusalem. And when they returned to Jerusalem, they found Jesus sitting among the lawyers and the doctors and the high educated people uh, asking questions and answering questions. So Mary approached him and says, Why have you dealt with us on this wise? Well, Jesus simply said, I must be about my father's business. Now let's think about that for a moment. Why did I bring that in? Here's the parents, earthly parents of, of the Lord, the Son of God, were somewhere out there in Jerusalem, and they had already left Jerusalem to go to their home, but they knew they had to return to Jerusalem. After a three-day journey, there's people out there in the world today that never touched Jerusalem in their obedience to the Gospel, rejected it completely, and they're out there going about thinking everything is fine. I'm okay. I'm a Christian. I'm in the Lord's church. What's missing in your life? If you didn't get the Lord in your life, by the word of the Lord that went forth from Jerusalem, you don't have the Lord in your life. Why? Because it's a calling of the gospel. So what should we do? Just the same thing told us Mary did. When you realize that God put the Spirit in Jerusalem that was going to preach the Gospel at Jerusalem, the church was going to be established at Jerusalem, where should you be in order to be a part of that church? You should be in Jerusalem. Because what God spoke through the prophets is not going to be changed. That the word of the Lord that goes forth from Jerusalem will build the house of the God of Jacob. That's the church. 
in the last days. So if we realize that we don't have Jesus in our life according to the word that went forth from Jerusalem, how many people now will do as Joseph and Mary did? How many of them will return to Jerusalem to get Jesus in their life by that specific word? There is a pride among the people today. It is a dangerous pride because they will not humble themselves to believe that with all of the doctrines of men that's in the world. Many of them won't return to Jerusalem. Many of them will never accept the baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. But it must be. Because when we learn that the apostles were told to tarry there in the city of Jerusalem and wait for that power from on high, that would be the Spirit descending from heaven upon them, only then could they begin to preach the gospel. That's why we don't have the gospel that's in the kingdom today that was in the life of Christ as He lived. Everything was changed from the time that Jesus lived in the flesh until He returned in the Spirit. You know that sometime back we've sent out a, a writing on that about the two phases of Jesus in the world. The first phase was to make ready the minds and hearts of the people to receive Him when He would return in that Spirit. Well, it didn't necessarily happen probably as Jesus wanted to because all of the people didn't hear and believe. And so Jesus in His lifetime, in the first phase of His life, was only setting in order what was going to happen when He would return. The church was not there as Jesus lived in the world. He had to return back to the Father. He had to go to the cross, give His life, be buried and be raised again the third day, and then work to that time that He would ascend back to the Father before He could come back. You remember Jesus said in John 14 and verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And when that Spirit descended from heaven on the day of Pentecost, it was the Lord that was that Spirit. And He was in control of completing now the mission that God had put upon Him when He was born into the world. It couldn't be completed in His life in the world. The shedding of that blood had to be done. It became the purchase price for the church. Acts 20, 28. And so all of these things happening bring us to the day of Pentecost when the Spirit returns to the disciples. So the second phase of the things that God had prepared for Jesus now begins with Jesus and the Spirit. This is where you will find the church coming into the world. Now, Peter was the man that was chosen to preach that gospel. Peter had kind of a rebellious attitude. But Jesus had a work for Peter. Maybe that was a training period for Peter. That he was going to depend upon Peter, give Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 16, 19. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so Peter was the man that was given the keys to open the kingdom to Israel on that day. Now as Jesus began to deal with the disciples, by that Spirit, we find that Israel really didn't know what to do. But they weren't afraid to ask. And they said in verse 37, Acts chapter 2, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Here begins the preaching of the gospel of salvation. Now what Peter had done had used that gospel being preached from verse 14, but that was the period of the gospel that convicted Israel. And until the gospel itself convicts you as being separate and apart from God, you cannot be saved from your sins. You won't realize that you're in sin. You have to first be convicted that you are a sinner by simply what Peter is preaching. Israel was convicted actually may be condemned in what they had done. Even though it was just by words, let him be crucified, it all fell upon Israel. And that's what Peter had identified with. So they asked, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let me say this. By what authority do we do this? Peter has just given a commandment to the disciples. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If this group of words had not been presented among the churches of Christ, that group of words is by the authority of. In the name of means by the authority of. If that would have not come, that is not a Bible quotation. Nowhere in all of the Bible. That came from the Bible studies, the books of men that have been written. That came out of those books, not out of the Bible. But if that phrase had not ever entered into the church, how many people would have gone to the bath through the water and been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Rather than saying in the name of means by the authority of and go somewhere else. How many more people would we have in the church today if that phrase would have been left out of the Bible? It is not a biblical phrase inspired of God. So men have done much harm to the body of Christ by bringing their sayings in. They say it means the same thing. Then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Do away with all that. Have the confidence and the sincerity of what the apostles are doing. It is their gospel. It was given to them by Jesus Christ in that spirit. Jesus is in control. And He's going to stay in control today. It's not about to change. So they said, well, what are we going to do? Well, Peter, give them the commandment. This is what you must do. Now he says also, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now when they were ready to submit to that word, verse 41, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized. And there were about 3,000 souls added to them that day. Why? Because their hearts had been convicted. Their hearts had been pricked. Their understanding had been opened by the Spirit of God that entered into the disciples, the apostles that were waiting there to take that gospel into all of the world. And so they did that. Peter was the man chosen of, of Christ to be that man. Peter, you go out there and you preach that gospel. I will give you the words. You hear what those words are, and that's what you preach. So since Peter was the man who was called upon, and we're talking about the period of the gospel, when that gospel began to be preached, then what has happened to that gospel today? Men have taken control of the gospel. And it don't mean that it's the gospel of Christ anymore. But it's the sayings of man that have become so important. There has come a name in our obedience to God that has risen in power above the name of Jesus Christ. But you will find that name written in the Gospel. It's not there. <coughs> but yet men have exalted that name above the name that God exalted in His Son. Philippians chapter 2, 9-11 through 11, tells us that God exalted Him, given Him a name above every name for the purpose of bringing you into this kingdom. So men have taken control of that gospel. Now we have another name that is even greater in the minds and the hearts of the people, not because the gospel reveals it, but because men have revealed it. Yes, it was a commission come from the Lord Himself. But until we receive it in the second phase of the life of Jesus by the Spirit, it is not going to profit us anything. And men and women need to know that and understand that today. So Peter being the man chosen of God to present that gospel into the world, then every apostle that picked up that preaching from that day followed that example. There is no other. 
I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're dealing with Peter in the preaching of the gospel. The importance of that gospel, the power of that gospel, and whose gospel it is. Yes, it is the gospel of Christ. But Paul says it is our gospel. By the Spirit of God, we have been given access to that gospel. Three places in the gospel that you can check there. And I'll just mention them and you can look there uh, if you're taking notes. Acts chapter 15, verse 24 through 28. And that teaches you the specific things of the gospel that are by the commandments of the apostles. The commandments of the apostles is the law. That's Acts chapter 15, 24 through 28. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and the first three or four verses. Again, emphasizing that the apostles are in control of getting the gospel out there into the world. It is the gospel that has been filtered through that Spirit of God. It is the gospel that is right. And that's not putting a rejection upon the name of Jesus Christ or anything that He did in His life prior to the church coming. But all of that has to be considered. And then we go to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2. Now those three areas of the gospel will teach you that the commandments for the church belong to the apostles. Nobody else. And of course Jesus in that spirit was keeping things in order. So as Peter had stood to preach that gospel on the day of Pentecost, that's what people were going to have to do. We varied away from that. Somewhat. But I want you to get this in your minds. Jerusalem is the city the word that goes forth from Jerusalem is the word. And the church that was established at Jerusalem by that word that went forth from Jerusalem is the church. There is no other church except that one that is called by His name that is obedient to all of the things that God has provided through that Spirit that He sent down on that day. Listen to what those men are telling you. So Peter says, I've got the solution. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Let all the words that Jesus taught you in His life come through that Spirit. It's going to be right. But now listen to what Peter says. Begin with 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse uh, 22. Now Peter said, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Peter could well have been directing this back to the day of Pentecost when Israel heard that word, believed it, and submitted themselves to that word to become a part of that kingdom. So Peter could have well been in mind. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the, the truth, how? Through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart permanently. Now look at verse 23. Being born again. That's where we start. John chapter 3. Being born again. But notice what Peter says. Not of corruptible seed. In other words, not by the seed that man is sowing, not by the changes that men are bringing into the gospel because of something that Jesus did in His life before He made His ascension. No, He said that's not the way. He says being born again, not of corruptible seed. I don't care how closely being related to the gospel, if it's not by the Spirit of God through that gospel that was preached by the apostles, it is not the power of God to save you from your sins. It cannot do that. And that's what Peter is saying here. When there is a word that's coming into your obedience that is not proven by this gospel that we're talking about today, that brought the church into the world, that added people to the church, then you're not in the church. The gospel is going to hold that power. Let me say it for you right here. Two passages. Romans 1, 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is what? The power of God unto salvation. That's the gospel. The gospel doesn't extend out of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost anywhere else. God provided everything for the people's salvation. 
So he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17. Why? For therein, where? The gospel. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So be careful when you become obedient to the gospel that you're not doing that by a corruptible seed. I'm simply saying to you by a word of the Lord that is not presented through that Spirit of God through the apostles. Any other words than those that the apostles prevented will be that corruptible seed. Now you might say that's a hard saying against Matthew 28 19. No, that's not a hard saying because I'm not rejecting Matthew 28 19. God sealed it up the moment that Jesus buried it at Galilee. God sealed it up in His name. God closed the door on Galilee as far as those words entering into the church. And that's exactly what men have done today. Gospel preachers throughout the church, they've broken that seal and they've opened that door. And they're bringing it right back in. Not by the Lord, but by their own understanding and ability to rightly divide that word. So it's not there for your salvation, nor for mine. So Paul and Peter gives us a warning in verse 23. Be born again. That's, that, that, that's great and good. And it must be. Be born again. But don't be born of a corruptible seed. But of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So where do we go from there? What is that word? Look at verse 25. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. The one we're talking about today. That was revealed by the Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost. There is no other. Because Mark 16, 15, He says, Go ye into all of the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It had to be preached by an apostle in order to be effective in our obedience to God to be added to the church. It has to be that way. And men are stuck upon themselves and, and, and prideful in manner and in heart and they will not come to that. But he said, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So what Jesus did in his life was, was, was very good. And he said everything in order. But he says that day comes, I'm making you that promise that that spirit is going to come. I'm going to send a comforter back and he will guide you into all truth. Let me combine John 14, 26 and John 16, 13. Now when that Spirit of God is, is going to descend, it's going to be that which God has ordained to bring the churches to the world and those that are failing to see that, well, the end will not be good. And so I'll, I'll get John 14 and 26 by reading John 16 and 13. John 15, 26 there if you want to turn there. But he says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Every bit of it. Won't be a thing left there. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. That promise is binding. Just like the, the, the prophets of Isaiah 2, 2 and 3, and Michael 4, 1 and 2, they're binding upon the church today. It will not be changed. God is not about to change it. And God will not exempt it in the day of judgment when you go there to be judged for what you have obeyed. It's going to remain. But until our life, until people today understand where they are with the Lord and they make that bow face in repentance, they go back to Jerusalem and they review that word again, knowing in their hearts that God is not going to ever change it again, but He's going to hold us accountable to that Word, and that is the Word that Peter preached on that particular day. Now Jesus said it's going to be bound on earth, it's going to be bound in heaven, it's never going to change. But yet today, we as churches of Christ are so far apart in our understanding of the Gospel. Where that Gospel begins, where it's going to end, and what that Gospel can do for us. So Paul gives us a warning, not Paul, Peter, gives us a warning after having established the church on the day of Pentecost. Now he comes back and says, See, you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart burden. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, 
but of incorruptible, that is by the Word of God, that is by the Gospel that we preach unto you, that is the Gospel that the Apostles handled, by the Spirit of God, there is no other. And then he says, and this is the Word preached by the Gospel, is preached unto you. Our time is coming to a close, but I want to turn back to Galatians chapter 1 to verify what we've said thus far. Now, the gospel is going to hold its power, as Paul says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. We depend upon that gospel. That began to be preached by the apostles. There is no other. And that's what Paul is going to tell us. Let me read to you from Galatians chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. Already through the churches of Galatia, it began to come back. Gospel beginning to be rejected. But Paul says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from this gospel that we preach to another gospel. Now look what he says, which is not another. My friends, there is no other gospel than that which the Spirit of God that Jesus revealed to the disciples in that Spirit and Jesus is that Spirit because 2 Corinthians 3.17 the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But G. Paul says there is not another Gospel. And that's what you will find when you search your Bibles and the New Testament of Acts chapter 15 24 through 28 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 1 through 3 and 2 Peter chapter 3 1 and 2. That's what you will find. There is no other gospel. There are no other commandments than only those that the apostles preached to you to be a part of that church. He says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Today, my friends, we have a perversion of the gospel of Jesus Christ that came through the apostles, <coughs> Jesus being the head of that government and that gospel that was preached on that day. Jesus in control of everything. But Paul says it again. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Our minds need to be unified. Especially in things pertaining to the church and to our salvation. So when you hear that gospel being preached, don't leave that gospel for some place else or because of some words of man. Don't leave that gospel because you're leaving Jesus Christ at Jerusalem. You leave Him at Jerusalem in your obedience to get into the church, you're going to have to come back. You won't find Him at Galilee. You won't find the word of the Lord going forth from Galilee that brought the church into the world. Except through the name of Jesus Christ. That's the order. So I don't reject it. Matthew 28 19, I receive it as it was sealed up in the name of Jesus Christ. God did that. And we know He did that simply because Jesus never brought it to the remembrance of the disciples when He returned in the Spirit. He didn't remember it. Well, He remembered it, but it just wasn't there, was it? So men, that's what men have done with the souls of the people today and literally destroying them, bringing every soul into jeopardy the moment they appear at the judgment seat of Christ. It's not going to happen, my friends. It just can't happen. If we're going to let God be true and every man alive. Romans chapter 4. Verse 3. So what are we doing with our lives? With our obedience? Understanding of the gospel? We're making God that life. Because men will not stay in Jerusalem. They will leave that city for another place simply because in the favor of men. Not because of the favor of God. So it's important to understand the gospel, what that gospel is, what gospel it is that we are to, to hear and believe. Yes, Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. And the day that the kingdom was established, it was established out of the preaching of that gospel. Not necessarily in words that Jesus has spoken to the disciples but what He had brought back in the Spirit. That's what gave us the church. And nothing prior to that day is open to the church. So whatever you have in your life, and as long as this is extended to the people out there, 
They need to hear it. Take it back to the Bible. Don't let Robert Adams interfere with your obedience to the Gospel. But search what I say. If you believe that I am wrong in my presentation of the Gospel, then go to the Bible and prove me wrong by the Bible. I don't want your words. Here's a false teacher teaching in the church of Christ. Don't give me your words. They're foolishness. Give me the word from the Lord that this is not the right way to go. Then I will repeat. And though I have been to Jerusalem, I will go back again if I need to. But what I will not do is I will not give up Jerusalem and go to Galilee for some man to tell me he's baptizing me in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's not going to happen. We're past that time. And we're into the time of the church. And we have so many yet that is to come into the church. So whatever your life is, depend upon the Lord. Depend upon God to change it through that Word. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Well, what word is it? Well, that is, as Peter says in verse 25 of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25. For this is the word that is preached <coughs> by the gospel. This is the gospel. So if you're here, if you're there, wherever you may be, as you get the message, and as you learn this and, and are taught this, go back to the Bible and search. Let the Lord lead you. Let God lead you out of that. It is His power. It is His thing to do. But I will read one other passage because it's important that we learn what that Spirit is, who it is that is directing us in our life, and if we can receive that Spirit, then we'll have the understanding that our bodies can be changed. Look at Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. Look at verse 13. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. How are you going to repent of your sins? Where does forgiveness come? Through the Spirit. That is related so many times through this Gospel that I preach to you today. You won't find that everywhere in the Bible. But the day that the church was established, all of it was opened up. This is our understanding. Now look at verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Spirit will take no one back to Galilee if the Spirit of God that raised up Jesus from the dead is dwelling in you. That Spirit will not let you go to Galilee to be remitted of your sins, to be added to the church. That is a different Spirit that is in men today that is doing that. That is the Spirit of the Word. And it is not under the control of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, it's out of control and has been out of control for a lot of years. Get it into your minds and hearts that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. And every time we make a submission to Jesus Christ, we are glorifying God our Father, which is in heaven. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. So the lesson is yours. If there be one here today that would need... A change in life? The only the Lord can do that. And He can only do that through that gospel that I have preached to you. Cannot be any other way. So if you're here today and you have a thing to do or to say or to repent of, then let this be the day. Before you leave the building, be sure that you are right and you're in the hands of the Lord as you go out there and do